Hi, my name is Gail Corley. I'm a member of Trinity Cathedral Parish and a member of the Trinity Legacy Society Committee there. And my career is I'm an estate planning attorney. I do estate planning, elder law, probate, and real estate transactions. And I've been practicing law for 35 to 40 years. I was asked to speak today a bit about who needs an estate plan and why and what is involved in it. I think anyone age 18 or older really needs to have an estate plan in place. For a young person, it can be very, very simple and basic, but I've had moms call me that can't make a doctor's appointment for a daughter who's 18 or 19. Um, parents can't always get grades or information if their kids are out of college. So they need a power of attorney in place. Also, uh, young couples with young children really should appoint a guardian for their children in the very unlikely and unfortunate event that both parents are killed young or die young, but it does happen. And they normally don't have valuable monetary assets. Their most important thing to them is their young children. So they really need to appoint a guardian for them. It's a substitute parent who would they want to rear the children in that event that both parents died young. People, once they buy a home or marry or start to accumulate assets, they really should have in place basic estate planning documents. Um, and if people are aging and worried about long-term care expenses, they may need to take some measures to protect assets, to not impoverish a spouse and be eligible for Medicaid or VA pension to pay for their long-term care. As far as the documents people should have in place, um, a general durable power of attorney, that's where you appoint someone to write your checks, sign deeds, leases, handle your property and financial affairs. Also a healthcare power of attorney, that's someone to make healthcare decisions for you in the event you can't, whether that's permanent due to dementia or short, short term, you're under anesthesia or after an accident or stroke. Um, a HIPAA authorization is what tells doctors the people with whom they can share your private health care information. Those can be the same people in your health care power of attorney, but sometimes there are, are additional people. And then a living will is end of life health care decisions. Do you want CPR or intubation or be put on a ventilator? That kind of thing with end of life decisions. There's one more document called a POLST, P-O-L-S-T, which is a physician's order regarding life-sustaining treatment, but you sign that in your physician's office, not your lawyer's office, and you typically cannot sign it until you're very aged, over 85, or you have a terminal illness, or your physician would not be shocked if you died within a year. But it's similar to a living will, but older people or really ill people should sign it. Then in addition to those documents, um, not the 18 or 19 year old, but any adult who is starting to accumulate assets should either have a last will and testament or a living trust. A lot of clients ask me, why should they create a living trust? A living trust does the same thing as a last will and testament, but a last will and testament has to go through probate after you die which is a process that takes about eight months to a year and a half, longer, several years sometimes. It's expensive. It requires filing an inventory of your assets and a list of your liabilities of public record at the courthouse. There are a lot of reasons people like to avoid probate. So if you have a living trust, you initially are the trustee, or if you're married, you and your spouse might both be the trustees, as long as you're alive and have mental capacity, the trust does the same thing a will would do. It says who gets your stuff after you die. It also provides for the management of assets during your lifetime, during your incapacity, and then who oversees everything both during your incapacity and after you die. Most importantly, it keeps everything private and it avoids the need to go through probate. Things can be resolved within a couple of weeks rather than many months. So it's a little bit more expensive to set up on the front end, but you still have complete control. You can amend it, revoke it, put assets in it, take assets out of it. And after your death, it's a lot less expensive and more private and saves money. Since I'm here on behalf of the Legacy Society, I feel like I need to say the smartest way to give money to any charity including Trinity Cathedral, is by beneficiary designation on your retirement plan or IRA. I say that because anyone, any individual who 
gets money after your death will pay income taxes at their income tax bracket, where a charity will not pay any income taxes. So if you want to leave money to a charity, do that with your retirement plan or IRA. Also, it means that if you want to include Trinity or another charity in your estate plan, you don't even need to call and engage an estate planning attorney. Just contact your financial advisor or the custodian of your IRA, add the, the charity as a beneficiary. It can be half of a percent, one percent, one hundred percent, or any percent you want. It's easy to change any time, easy to update, and you don't have to amend a will or trust to do it. Um, and like I said, it's it's smart tax wise, and then also if during your lifetime you can give your tithe or pledge to the church or money to any charity by assigning your RMD or required minimum distribution annually to the church, rather than taking the money and paying tax on it and then giving a small of the net amount to the Trinity, you can just assign it to Trinity and it goes tax free. So it's a very smart way to give money once you're of an age that you're taking required minimum distributions. So really from 18 on, you need something in place in the way of an estate plan, but it will grow with you, change with you, amend it over your life as children grow, as your estates grow, etc.